Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Keith, and I'm the training coordinator for parents and families in the Outreach Services for the Blind and the Deaf program housed at Florida School for the Deaf and the Blind. I'm here today because I'm going to be presenting a workshop for you. That workshop is titled Man Laws for Moms, Understanding Dads, and Why We Do What We Do. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this. We're going to take a a look at men and why we do the things we do, why we behave like we behave. And uh, hopefully, moms, ladies, you will understand us a little bit better. And maybe by the time we're done, have some ideas on how to help get us more involved and, more in, and basically participate more in the special ed process and with your children. Uh, a little bit about myself first. Like I said, I do this professionally. Uh, I work in one of the state discretionary projects. I've been doing it for about, about nine years now. Uh, I am also a parent, for those of you who may not know that. Uh, I am, my son is uh, 20 years old now. He is deaf, and he also has uh, chorioathetoid cerebral palsy. He is also at St. John's River State College in the computer science program. So. We've been through the educational process in the public school and are now into the college world, and it is truly a different world. Um, not a bad thing, just, just different growing up, as that may be. So a lot about what I'm going to talk about today is going to involve me. Rather than throwing somebody else under the bus, I'll throw my, myself and my own family under the bus. Um, with that, let me go ahead and get started. First, when we talk about men, we are far different than you guys, than you ladies are. In many ways, we are still cavemen in blue jeans. And to understand why men are what we are, why we behave like we behave, we have to go way back in time to the beginnings of civilization, the beginnings of cultural society, the beginnings of society in general, really. Um, to understand the early, early t days when human beings were beginning to create uh, groups, to live in groups. Uh, these groups were typically small. Uh, Y'all heard the expression hunter-gatherer societies. <clears throat> groups of maybe a hundred at most uh, that lived together. There was a very strong division of labor. Uh, typically this was something that helped the society survived, the group survived. Uh, typically the men went out and did the hunting. They, did the, they were in the hunter role. The ladies were in the gatherer role. Uh, they took care of the, the camp area. They took care, they gathered the, the, the less risky jobs, I should say, they did. They handled the child rearing, uh, et cetera. And this was important because this, this division of labor was important because it was critical to the survival of the society. For instance, if you have a group that goes out and hunts a mammoth, say you have 25 men who go hunt a mammoth, and 12 of them get run over by said mammoth, that leaves you with about 13 guys. But back at camp, you're still going to have, at, at, your, at your, your camp area, you're still going to have all the ladies. The reality is that for society to survive, it has to be able to reproduce. If you take the female element out of the equation, you will not have children. You will not have offspring. You will not have a next generation. You can take a segment of the men out of the population, and the women are still going to be able to reproduce. You're still going to carry on that next generation. So that, that clear division of labor was really important in that time period and in that society for ensuring the survival of small group societies. Over time, obviously, those small groups became large groups. But it, in the beginning, it was very small group oriented. Now, what's interesting, a little interesting fact, this is from Archaeology Magazine in March and April of 2007. They actually reported a finding based on healed bone fractures that indicated that Neanderthals were at a competitive disadvantage to, to, human, to humans 
because both sexes competed equally in the big game hunts in Neanderthal society. They were an egalitarian society. But what that meant is that lack, is this the lack of division of labor reduced the species' ability to live at a higher, more advantageous, at a, excuse me, at a, to live at higher, more advantageous population densities. In other words, hunting equally took elements out of the society that were needed to reproduce that society for future generations. Okay? I was amazed because I was so thrilled to find that because actually this workshop was created in its first iteration before I actually ran across that in a doctor's office while thumbing through a magazine one day. But it goes to prove my point. So when we talk, start talking about men, we have to start thinking about us as basically cavemen in blue jeans. We have not evolved particularly far. Ladies, you guys on the other hand have. Now, those cultural roles that are established are hard to break. Cultural roles are usually passed down through the family. They're passed down from father to son, often from mother to daughter. And that goes on generation after generation after generation, all the way down through time. Even when those roles maybe don't really serve a purpose anymore, they are still passed down because that's what societies and cultures do and families do. So let's look. Let's look a little bit at history, at, 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 at men through history, at, at, at the cultural roles through history. When we look at ancient Greece and Rome, women were still in this gatherer side of the society. It was still a very strong division of labor. Men were the warriors, they were the hunters, they were the, the skilled laborers. Women, for all intents and purposes, in, in, in some of those societies were chattel. They were property. They, they served the purpose of reproducing the species and making sure that the household was taken care of. But it was a man's show, to be quite honest. When we look at the ancient myths, what do we see? What is women's role? Women's role is either as a disruptor or as kind of a off-the-screen off the kind of character that is some um, goal for the man to achieve. But very rarely do you see the women being central to, to any of the, the myths and stories that, that the culture, and, and let's face it, every culture perpetuates its own myths based on their own society. Okay? Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance. We see a similar division going on through that time period as well. Women simply are in a secondary role. They are not equals by any sense of the imagination. What is interesting, and I always talk about, when we talk about Dark Ages, and Middle, and Middle Ages, the Renaissance, when you look at women who are famous in that time period, they are unique in that they were put in, wound up in positions that made them s strong, that made them, gave them authority, but they were few and far between. My favorite, I, my, my background is, a, is, I have some history background, particularly in English history. And when we look at English history, probably one of the most famous characters is Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I of England in the 1500, late 1500s to about, I think, 1603, I think, is when she died. When she was, she was, uh, the, um, she was the daughter of Henry VIII. When she took over England, she took over a country that at that time was probably the poorest country in Europe. Near broke, had next to little, next to no military whatsoever. By the time she died, about I had the exact time frame escapes me, but it was about 40 years that she was queen. She left England as probably the most powerful and richest country in Europe. She had defeated the largest empire in Europe at the time, the Spanish. She had held off the French and basically turned into England into the powerhouse of Europe. One of the most fascinating things through that entire, her entire reign, her privy council, which was her leadership, her cabinet, for all intents and purposes, 
continued to find, try and find some member of royalty that she could marry because they were terrified about the country, her position as being a queen. A queen wasn't capable. Yet most of her privy council was terrified of her because they knew how strong and powerful a woman she really was and how wonderful a not only politician but a dread sovereign that she was. But yet, right up till near the end of her life, they were continuing to try and find somebody where they could marry her off to. She maintained power by refusing to marry. Had she married, she would have surrendered the reins of England to whoever her, her consort was. She would have resumed a subservient role. Isn't it interesting? But we see this separation. Here are the men, here are the women. Here's the power base, here's the... Not power base, I guess. Lack of power. <coughs> this continues on into the New World. We move into the New World. What happens? We have the settlement in the East, eventually moving westward. Who are the people we hear about, typically? You hear about Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, people like that. You don't hear much about women in the New World. Again, cultural separation. Women are, are there to, to take care of the family, run the estates. Daniel Boone would disappear for years at a time. His family living on the edge of the frontier, dealing with Indian menace, dealing with wild animals, dealing with isolation, and his wife, Rebecca, was left to run the household. She did quite well at it, evidently, but she never gets any credit. There was a period of time, and I, I, I have heard this story from many sources. I've seen it in several of the biographies that I've read of him. There is a story that at one point Daniel disappeared for about three years. When he got home, found Rebecca with a one-year-old. The math doesn't add up. His question to her was, who's dad? And it turned out she claimed it was his brother. His response was, well, at least she kept it all in the family and raised that child as his own. But the fact of the matter was, here you have this woman, and she was not unique to the time period, living on the edge of the frontier, to raising a family, taking care of a, of, a, of a homestead by herself while her husband spends three years out hunting, basically. Hunting and exploring. Not really responsible to anybody but himself. It's a wonderful life if you can get it from a guy's perspective. <laughs> but very, very strong women who, who don't get credit because the culture doesn't allow it. The, the cult, when we think about when the settlers moved west, you would, I, you'd hear stories, particularly in the, the, the Oklahoma territories and places like that where, where you would have these large homesteads and the, the, the sod cabins where you'd have one family and usually a lot of times it would be the woman staying at home raising the children by themselves in the middle of this wilderness in the, on the Great Plains where there's nobody around. Husband's off doing whatever. You know, this is a constant theme throughout our time period, through our development historically. What do we see, though? Men's roles and women's roles are kept separate. Okay? <clears throat> when we look at literature, even, we, let's talk about literature a little bit because we can see so much of, I, I'm a, my, my, college degree is political science major and I was a minor in English with a specialization in, in particularly medieval English literature which Shakespeare um, when we look at Shakespeare and we look at much of the literature we will see this division of labor kind of placed in the literature it's, it's part of the culture Shakespeare does a wonderful job of reflecting culture and one of my favorite plays is Henry V that play it's about honor, it's about duty, it's about loyalty, it's about the brotherhood of men, 
and women are not included. Women serve a very subsidiary role. Catherine of France, who will eventually becomes his, become uh, Henry's wife, his own, her only real role in that play is as the prize. She is the prize. If Henry wins, not only does he get France, eventually he gets France, but he also gets a wife of royal blood who is the offspring of one of the strongest countries in Europe. Right. So anyway, again, we see this cultural theme continuing. This speech is Henry V's speech at, at the Battle of Agincourt. To me, it's one of the best speeches ever written, one of the best speeches ever given in, in, in theater. And it all talks about the brotherhood of man. And you have to remember, you're in a culture that's very, not only divided on a sexual basis, but divided on a class basis as well. People did not move from a low class to a middle class to an upper class. Nobility was separate. You were born into nobility. But in this speech, and for any of you who don't know, Battle of Agincourt uh, was a battle that Henry fought in France against the French, where he was vastly outnumbered. The French fully expected it to be a complete slaughter of the English. The reality was just the opposite. Thousands and thousands of French nobility and soldiers died that day, and reports were a 100 or less English died. It was the advent of the longbow. The longbow was a weapon that could shoot, actually shoot through plate armor. And the English used it to great efficiency. It was also the beginning of the end of the age of chivalry. Because for the first time, the common man could fight a knight on horseback and win. From that point forward, the age of chivalry began its decline. But this speech, he is saying that all those people, all those soldiers, all those common people with him, at the, who were willing to shed their blood with him, to die with him, to fight with him, at the Battle of Agincourt, that in the years in the future, that they would strip their sleeves and show their scars and, to, to the people around them and say, I was with Harry the King and with Exeter and Salisbury and Warwick and all the nobility. And that other people in England at that who see this, other men, will hold themselves lesser of a man than they are because they were willing to stay and fight with the king. And further, and this was a very interesting element to this, that as far as Henry the king was concerned, those commoners would be his brother. They would be his brothers. And that meant a lot in that day, far more than it does today. For a, for a nobility, a king, to say to a commoner, I will consider you my brother. For, for bleeding with me on this, in this battle. That is huge. And what's interesting about this is there, there is evidence that after the battle, those commoners were allowed to have a coat of arms, something that commoners really weren't given access to. Only nobility had that at right. But if they fought at Agincourt, the king gave them the right to, to, to a coat of, their own, of arms of their own a sign of respect, okay? But this is where, you all seen the movie, have you, ever, have you all ever seen that, uh, the, the, the series Band of Brothers? This is where that title comes out of, okay? This is where that title comes out of. But the bottom line to this whole speech is, is that element of this is what men are, this is who you are, this is what we are, we are men, and we will stand and fight and bleed together. It's that brotherhood of men, that band of brothers. Now, I'm showing you this for a reason. Yes, it was written around 1588. Now, let's roll ourselves forward to today's time. There was a movie 
not long ago, maybe about 10 years ago now, some of y'all, if you're football fans, you probably know it, called The Replacements, starred Keanu Reeves and Gene Hackman. Basic storyline was, and it's based on, it's, that movie's actually based loosely on some, on some factual events in football. There was a time period in the 80s when the NFL went on strike, the players went on strike, and the, team, and the teams brought in replacement players. Guys who had played ball somewhere in their life and had a skill, but they weren't really good enough for the NFL. They were bar keeps and, 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 and truck drivers and policemen and whatever else, but they got the opportunity and they took it. At the end of the movie, the team is playing Dallas. And Dallas, the, the NFL players, or the league's players who are on strike in this movie, that team has crossed the picket line. So they're playing against the real McCoy, the real top-notch players, okay? And, they're, and if they win, the replacement team wins, the team will go to the playoffs. And it's near the end of the game, and everybody's beat up, they're dragging, but they're starting to move, they're moving the football. But it's still, the game's about over, and they're not sure if they're going to be able, if there's enough time to get the ball to the end zone. And Keanu Reeves, who's a quarterback in the, character in this, walks into the huddle and says this. Okay? And says this. Pain heals, chicks dig scars, but glory lasts forever. It's the same speech. Shakespeare says it a whole lot nicer, but it's the same theme. And for men, this matters to us big time. We get it. We still understand this, okay? Pain heals, chicks dig scars, but glory lasts forever. That's who we are. Now, today, let's look at the group dynamics a little bit. Men have gone from hunting the mammoth to hunting the bass. How many of you all have husbands who fish or hunt? Same idea. They are proving their status as men. We go out, we hunt, some, track something down, and we want to kill it. Even if it's with, with a, large, a large gauge rifle at a, at a couple of hundred yards, it's not the same as putting a spear into a mammoth, but it's the same mindset. My father-in-law, love him to death, good man. He's a fisherman. And I'll never forget going fishing with him out on Chesapeake Bay. And that fish, by the time we got home, was this. And my mother-in-law going, well, where is it? Well, we gave it away to somebody else they did. And she's like, you can see her going, uh-huh, yeah, right. And I'm just sitting there going, rolling my eyes, going, no, I'm not saying a word because I am on good relations with my father-in-law and I'd like to keep it that way. Don't insult his fish. It's status for us. My wife grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. They would shut schools down the first three days of hunting season, deer hunting season, because there was going to be nobody in the schools. Every male in the county was out in the woods with a rifle looking for a deer. It's what men do. I'm not a hunter, never been my thing, but I understand why people do it. It's all about man status, status inside the group. Status between other men. Okay? It's really important to guys. Think about cars that go fast. I, again, I'm not a car person, but I, but I, I have, friend, have friends growing up who had the glass packs on their car to make it go, bah, 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 bah. you know, that, that big noise and the feeling of being macho and having power and, under their control. It's man status. It's being the hunter in the hunter-gatherer society. That is something, the mindset that is passed down from father to son. And it's the hardest thing in the world to break. It is also 
something that is passed down to almost every male somewhere along the line. So there is also that reinforcement from the peer group that goes on. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The garage. How many of y'all have a spouse, a husband, or significant male other that has a TV set in their garage? Or a refrigerator out there that they use to store their beer in or other drinks? It's the man cave. It's the place we can retreat to to hide. It's our safe spot in the world where only testosterone rules. If duct tape can't fix it, then it needs to be replaced. I will never forget growing up. My dad, we had a furnace in the house I grew up in. He kept it running for 25 years with duct tape. The thing was falling to pieces, and he just kept putting more and more layers of duct tape on it. When they sold that house and moved, they almost didn't get the sale completed because my father could not understand why the people want him to replace that furnace. He was more than happy to supply them with a case of duct tape because it would work perfectly fine for 25 years. And there was no reason for them to have to do anything different. Part of our role is to fix things. How many of you ladies have looked at your husband and said, I don't want you to fix it, I just want you to listen? We think it's our responsibility to fix things. We try and do it for you, even when we shouldn't be. Because that's way how we were brought up. My wife, we'll have discussions. I'll look at her and say, okay, honey, I need to know something. Am I just listening or am I fixing? Because invariably, if I guess, I'm going to guess wrong. And she'll laugh. Now, we've been married 20, going on 27 years now. At this point in our lives, she just laughs and said, I just need you to listen. I don't need you to fix. Or she'll say, no, this is, I want an answer to this one. I said, okay, great. We'll go. At least I know what road to take. For guys, when we talk about it, one of the things you should know, we should know in terms of fixing things, we're supposed to know the name of those tools. What do you mean you don't know what a pipe wrench is? You do know what that, you have to, because it's not from a man's perspective in a man's world, you know what those tools are, and you don't admit to not knowing it. Give me the thing Bob. no, no, the other, the doohickey over there, no, the other one, to your left, to your left. If we don't know what it is, we'll give directions on how to get to it and do everything we can to avoid saying, I don't know what it's named, but that's what I'm looking for. That's what we're doing. We're covering to make sure that we still look right in terms of our man status with our group. So, is your garage your husband's man cave? Think about it. We do have unwritten rules. Whether your husband, fiance, boyfriend, or significant male other knows it or not, he instinctively knows these rules and they are not written down anywhere. And these rules govern our behavior. Under these rules, what is acceptable in public may not be acceptable in private. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. What is acceptable in, pub in private may not be acceptable in public. Have you ever dated a man <coughs> excuse me, who would hold your hand and cuddle up with you in private, but in public won't hold your hand? Anybody? Yeah. That's a man law. Those are rules that we live by. It's a certain degree of comfort is required before we can cross over that line. And you've heard guys talking, oh yeah, you know, he's, she's got him wrapped around his little finger. It's a step down in the world of man status to admit that you are, that you are under the thrall of a woman's Assets, thoughts, whatever you want to call it. That a woman has power over you. I will never forget, perfect example, when I was in college, I met my wife our senior year. 
My college roommate and I were great friends. We'd known each other since we were freshmen. We'd roomed together for two previous years to our senior year. My college roommate was a, is a, short, was a short guy, a little short fella. He's one of those people everybody on campus knew and liked. He was everybody's best friend. Just one of the most easygoing and friendly people you could ever have, you could ever know. Got along real well with my wife, or my, at this time, girlfriend. And I'll never forget, we still to this day laugh about it. It was January. My wife had come down, my, my girlfriend had come down to visit for the weekend. And my roommate came back, it was like a Saturday night, and wanted us to go out with him, go over to a party at a fraternity house. And we kind of went, I was like, nah, you know, we're going to skip it tonight. We got something else planned. And my roommate had had a little too much to drink. And I'll never forget, he got up in her face, looked at my wife, and my wife was actually taller than he is. Got up in her face and looked at her and went, this is your fault. And my wife, my, my girlfriend at the time was sitting there going, like, what is this all about? And he's going, this is your fault. And, and she finally said, what do you mean it's my fault? It's your fault. You've domesticated him. And he turned and stomped out of the room. My, my girlfriend, now wife at the time, and I went into hysterics. It was the funniest thing I had ever seen. I'd never seen him lose his temper over ever, anything in four years of knowing him. Not like that. The funny part was the next day he was so apologetic to my then girlfriend. Good guy, good guy, still is still a really good friend. But it was a funny story, but it, it explains. We have our roles, we have our rules, and one of the things is admitting when a woman has cast control or power over you as a man. It's a hard thing for us to admit. And we know we're going to catch flack about it from the other guys. It's a given. There are even websites that talk about this. So let's review some of those unwritten man, man laws. Maybe some of this will make sense to you. If nothing else, I always find them amusing. It is okay for a man to cry only under the following circumstances. When the heroic dog dies to save its master, or after wrecking your boss's car. Think about it. How many times does your man cry in public? Not many. Women, you see it happen all the time. At a movie, watching chick flicks. Why do you think they're so uncomfortable for us? We don't want to admit to emotion, but we'll talk about emotion in a minute. When stumbling upon other guys watching a sporting event, you may ask the score of the game in progress, but you can never ask who's playing. You should know that. That's, that's part of the man code or man law. Any man who brings a camera to a bachelor party may legally be killed and eaten by his buddies. And there is no reason ever for guys to watch ice skating or men's gymnastics. Think about it. How many times have you ever seen your male significant other, brother, father, friend, whatever, sit down and watch men's gymnastics? I am sorry, even during the Olympics, that was my time to go do something else. No. It is something that we find somewhat threatening to our testosterone levels. Sorry. It's not politically correct, but it's true for most guys. If you've known a guy for more than 24 hours, his sister is off limits forever unless you intend on marrying her. I can attest that this is true. My best friend growing up, who I had known since we were in like second grade, had three sisters. He was the youngest, a twin of the four children. He was a twin with, his, uh, with, his, with a sister 
and they were the two youngest in the family. We had hung out together from the time we were little. We played football in high school together. Basically, if you found one of us, you found the other one unless we were on a date or something with somebody. I will never forget my freshman year in college. His, he had a sister who was a year older than he was. She was going to college not far from where I was. I saw her over Christmas that year, and she basically asked me out. Privately, not in front of everybody, but kind of said, you know, hey, you know, you want, let's go, you know, get together and we'd go do some stuff and blah, 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 blah. She was gorgeous. I mean, she was, she was beautiful. And I really thought about it, but this is what came into play in my mind. I never actually took her up on, on the offer. I nev we never went out. And, and the reason was is because I'm like, if I had to go out with this girl and, and something goes wrong, this is my best friend we're talking about. He will either want to kill me or he will never speak to me again. And he was a big guy. He was a big guy. We, he played next to me on the line. He was a tackle. He probably had me by six inches and about 40 pounds. I was a guard. Big, big fella. I didn't really want to see him get mad because I'd seen that happen once or twice in other situations. I really didn't want to go there. Anyway, moaning about the brand of free beer in a buddy's fridge is also forbidden under man laws. You take what you get, especially when it's free. These are just some of the things. Think about your spouses. Think about your significant others. Don't these things apply? They're not really written down anywhere, unless you go to some of these websites. But they're not really written down anywhere. But us as guys, we know it. We know our culture and our world is, a little, is different from yours. The reality is true. Emotion. Now we're going to get to emotion. Men are brought up with some, in his part of these rules with some specific rules dealing to emotion. First off, we are supposed to be strong for you. It is our responsibility to be strong for, 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 you, for, our, for our significant others, for our spouses, for our women. It's our job to take care of the weaker sex. Okay? Emotion is very uncomfortable for us. Why? Emotion in a man's world is often considered weakness. And we are never supposed to show weakness because we can't be strong for you if we're showing weakness. Make sense? Not really, but it's the way it is. We do, the emotion is there, but we work very hard to keep it covered. We hide it, and it will go, and trust me, it will fester, especially if you're trying to raise a child with special needs. You're dealing with those issues. Let's say that they are emotional issues, stressful issues, but our job is to hide things like that, not to let it be seen. We are supposed to be the rock for the family. Emotions also have a tendency to make us pull back from things. One of the things that I hear all the time from moms is I can't get dad involved. Dad stays away from meetings. Dad seems to work all the time. A lot of this is simply related to the fact we're trying to, to deal with our emotions and we do that by dropping into cultural roles. What are our cultural roles? Remember hunter-gatherer. Our job is to provide. We don't know what we do. We fall into those roles. We work more. We try and bring more money home. We try and be there to protect the family. But we stay away from those things that cause emotion. And a lot of times, men don't realize they're doing it. It's just our programmed response. It's how we were brought up. Okay? Work. Again, we are supposed to provide. In stressful situations, if we aren't providing, we are failing the family. We are not doing our given cultural role. We are failing at it, which causes, to, causes us to double down and work twice as hard to provide. Now think about it in a world where insurance coverage for, for kids with special needs is very difficult. 
How many of you have probably dealt with situations where services aren't covered or covered only to a limited amount and you're trying to balance out paying the mortgage, getting gas for the car, food on the table, and then figuring out how you're going to pay a couple hundred dollars a month in co-pays or other fees for services your child needs? It's not easy. And when we get into those situations, for us as men, we're not succeeding. We're failing you. We're failing our family. And we are torn between being there for the family and working. I had a, had a dad come up to me after a session I did for dads a few years ago and said, you know, we, we had talked about this very issue. And he said, you know what, I couldn't figure out why he, I was working so much. He, this guy said he was putting in six, seven days a week. And a lot of it was, it was his way partially of hiding from the situation but it was also his way of making himself feel better because the more he worked, the more overtime he brought in, the more money was available there to ensure that the family bills would be paid. We're trying to kill the mammoth. We're trying to provide. It's our natural reaction to stress. When we don't know what to do, we will bury ourselves in our cultural roles and how we were brought up as to what we're supposed to do, whether it's right or wrong. It's like it's pre-programmed, and you don't know what to do, the switch gets thrown, and away we go. It's a safe haven for men. Okay? Think about it. Now, let's talk about dealing with dad, because you can help your dad pass this. You can help him through some of these cultural roles and get him more involved with the family, more involved with you, and more willing to talk and open up a little bit. But it's hard. You're constantly going to be fighting these, in, these in-programmed cultural roles that he's dealing with. First off, it's very easy to get frustrated with us. Believe me, I know. My wife is frustrated with me quite a bit on things, so I understand. It is. And most of the time, I'm at fault for, it, for, for her getting frustrated with me, with good reason. But how do you deal with, with dad? How do you deal with a guy? First off, ladies, don't lecture. The absolute worst thing you can do to a guy is start lecturing him in a stressful situation because he's going to pull back. You're adding more stress. You're telling him he doesn't know what he's doing. At least that's the perception the guy's going to have. You're telling him he's not being successful at what he's trying to do. And you're going to fire off every cultural bit of knowledge he has about how he's supposed to behave, and he'll fall back more into it. He'll move away from the emotional stress that's being created, and he'll pull away. If you do have to lecture, you've got to do it carefully, strategically, and in a way where he doesn't realize he's being lectured. You can, ladies, you are evolved. You can outthink us. Use your minds. One thing you can do, his job is to, he sees his job as protecting the family and caring for the family. Tell him, let him know that a big part in your mind, what you really need to help protect the family and take care of the family, is him to be involved. His involvement goes a long way to solving the problems, to fixing the problems. Remember, we like to fix things. Remember that we like to fix things. Help him find something to fix. Tell him we need you, even if you don't, and you've got it all under control, but you want him more involved. Give him the opportunity. I really need your help on this, you know. Your opinion matters to me because I'm not sure if I'm going the right way. What do you think? Even if he responds and he's so far out in left field that you're going, oh my God, what planet did they drop him on? When the aliens picked him up and brought him back, where'd they put him? Because they didn't put him back in reality. Fine. Just go, oh, okay. You know, let me think about it because that makes some sense. Let me figure out. Give him a reason to want to be 
helpful. If you look at him and say, dear God, what planet did you fall off of? You will never, you, he will never get himself involved in that situation again because you've just told him he's not, he's not successful at it. He's not being helpful. Express the need for his involvement with his child. One of the big issues dads run across in dealing with children with special needs is figuring out what to do. They don't want to hurt the child. But they're not good at figuring out what to do with them. <clears throat> in my situation, with my son, I was brought up, my dad was a great father. He was an elementary school principal who was an ex-Marine. He said it was the best training in the world for running an elementary school, by the way. But he was always there. He never missed a sporting event. I played football from the time I was eight years old through college. I played ice hockey in, in high school. I played baseball up through and into high school. He never missed a game. In Little League, he coached. And the thing that was nice about that, he was not a screamer. He looked at everything as education. Everything was a way to teach. I saw him lose his temper at a baseball game one time when I was about 14. He was in the dugout, and I remember coming off the field, and, and I, as I'm coming off the field, and it wasn't at me, directed at me, but it just, it was, it was a frustration. I, he took his hat off, slammed it on the ground, and I saw him stiffen up, look around, bend down, pick his hat off, and dust it off, and put it back on. And that was the extent of the anger I ever saw in all the years he was involved. It was a wonderful, wonderful way to be with my dad. We were close, always were, still are. When my son and my wife was pregnant, and we were talking, if it was a boy, what did I, how did I want to be? Well, I wanted to be just like my dad. I wanted to coach Little League football and Little League baseball and do all those things that he did for me. Well, Ian's born, and we've got, other, we've got issues going on. That's not going to happen. For a lot of dads, it's really hard looking for alternatives to what they know as the norm of what dads and sons or dads and daughters do. I was lucky. We found two outlets that, that, that turned out really well. First off, we all, our family really enjoys being around animals, big animals too. Um, and it just so happened that Ian we found a hippotherapy program, which was therapeutic horseback riding, which was great. Gave him independence. He and I would go down the road. It was about an hour away from the house. My wife went with us a lot of times, but there were times she didn't, and it was, it was kind of our thing. We'd go down the road, and I'll never forget, sitting in the car, he's about four years old, and we're doing the man song in sign language, which was men, 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 men. People in the car next to us must have thought we were nuts, but we had fun. We stopped at the, at, the, at the gas station when we went. Gas station had a Dunkin' Donuts in there. That was breakfast. He, Ian would usually have a couple of Boston creams, and I'd have three, maybe three glazed. And he'd have a Mountain Dew, and I'd have a Coke, and that was breakfast. I give my wife a lot of credit. She's a wise woman at times, most of the time, all the time. After we'd started that routine, she went with us. And we're driving down the road in my son signs gas store. Donuts. And I'm going, my first thought was, oh, okay. My second thought is, oh, dear God, I'm busted big time. My wife goes, why are we pulling into the gas station? And why is our son signing donuts? And I'm like, well, yeah. and I kind of had to fess up and explain the situation. And she thought about it, and she said, you know, it's really not a particularly healthy breakfast, is it? And I'm going, no, it really isn't. And she said, you know what? When you guys are together, it's your time. I'm not going to complain about it. Fine. Have that breakfast. But please, on those days, no more junk food the rest of the day. I'm like, thank you, dear. Wonderful. It was affirmation that we were doing it okay, and that Ian and I were doing things good, and Mom bought into it. And as I'm getting out of the car, to, 
to go in to get the donut. She's, by the way, could I have like a, a chocolate one with sprinkles and a coffee? Oh, sure, no problem. We're good. But we found hippotherapy. It was great. Here I've got my five-year-old who at the time was using a posterior walker controlling a 2,000-pound or 1,200-pound animal, whatever size, how much a horse weighs. And he's loving it. He's in, he is the man in charge. He's a good rider. He's actually a real good rider. He was in hippotherapy for about two years, and they actually kicked him out. His last event in, in hippotherapy, the therapist actually entered him in a obstacle course contest in a ring where he rode the horse by himself, had to go weave through obstacles, back the horse up, get, some, get it through some different gates and things. And she was like, he doesn't need hippotherapy anymore. He needs regular riding classes. So we moved him over and he did ride, and we would go to the riding classes. To this day, he still rides. I'll never forget when we, which leads me to our second thing that I found. We found scouts. Boy Scout, Cub Scouts first, and then Boy Scouts. I did Cub Scouts. It was cool, no problem. It was something Ian enjoyed immensely. Didn't require huge amounts of physical ability. He did really well with it. First year I interpreted, went and was his interpreter. The second year, I'll never, we're sitting at the, before the year started, we were sitting at an adult meeting and our Cub Master had been transferred suddenly out of state and everybody's sitting around and going what are we going to do for a scout ma a cub master and me being stupid piped up and said well if you can't find anybody I'll be happy to do it and of course every guy at the table is going busted so I wound up spending two very enjoyable years his last two years in cub scouts as the cub master we had a ball we had a troop, by the time we were done, probably a third of our troop were kids out of the special needs program at the elementary school there, and we had a ball. It was something the two of us could do together. Ian went on to Boy Scouts. He's an Eagle Scout. He's an Eagle Scout, and I was his, the Scout Master as we moved up the process. And I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret. I hate camping with a passion. I see no reason to sleep in a tent on the ground when I can be in a Motel 6. That's camping to me. But he loved it, so we did it together. We found those things. But my wife was so instrumental because she kept expressing, we've got to find something for the two of you guys to do together. He needs that experience. He needs to see Dad. He needs to be involved with Dad. It was important. She did a really nice job of this last thing, of brain, getting me to help her brainstorm about how he and I could do some things together that weren't the norm things like football and baseball, or at least in my world, football and baseball. The more I think back on it, I think she kind of knew where she wanted that conversation to go, but she let, it, let me think it was my idea. Again, ladies, outthink them. You're smarter than we are. Express dad's importance to the family as more than just a wage earner. Again, combat that cultural role of being the provider, of being the hunter. Now remember too, he has many of the same fears as you do, but we've been taught to submerge it. Guys have been, caught to, have been taught to hide it. Understand that. Be aware of that. Because when you can see those emotions starting to roil underneath, he'll get edgy. And maybe get short and snippy. You all had that happen? That's probably part of what's going on, particularly if you're dealing with a child your child with disabilities. He wants to, but it's so hard to break through those cultural roles, that, those man laws. Encourage him to meet with other dads, and I say this with trepidation, because the last thing you can do is look at dad and say, hey, I know this group where you can go talk to other dads and kids with special needs. He's going to run the other way as fast as he possibly can and never look back. 
the last thing we want, because you're telling him, I found a group of guys where you can go and talk about all these emotional things. Uh-uh, no way, not going to happen. Not going to happen. But what you got to do is, again, outthink him. Maybe you have a friend. A friend of one of, you, of your child. Another lady who also has a husband. Maybe you guys could arrange to go out to dinner, the two couples. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. But you, gotta put, you can put him together in a situation where he's with another dad who has a child with a similar situation. They're not going to talk about it the first time they get together, probably. If you try and push it, they're both going to smell set up and run. But if you let them develop that friendship and put them in positions where over a period of a couple of months where those two dads or a group of dads have a situation where they can begin to get to know each other, eventually they will let, somewhere along the line that conversation will take place. Again, patience. You have to be patient and you have to move slowly and cautiously. Give them that opportunity. Set those opportunities up. But again, don't force it. Because if you force it, it's not going to happen. I will tell you, I love when I get to travel down to Tampa. There's a man there who is also a father of a, of a, of a young woman who is about the same age as my son who has some disabilities, and some of them are similar to mine, my son. And it's nice because he and I both are in this field and we can get together for dinner or something and chat about all this stuff. And no, we don't have to worry about it because we both know each other from the professional side of things. It's what we do. It's just our jobs. But we're also friends and it allows us to have that chat with another guy without any fear or concern about what somebody else may think. To be able to just completely relax and have a conversation with another man on this topic, it's very hard to find and it's very wonderful to be able to do that on, on occasion, it means a lot to, 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 to us guys, if you can find that kind of situation and get them into that situation. Remember, remain calm. Do not explode. Try not to be angry. Be rational. Somebody has to. It may as well be you. Continue to talk. As long as you keep the conversation going, the doors stay open and you can get him into a place where you want him to be. Okay? Keep talking. Now, we're going to move into what I call the nuclear question for a dad. Once you've got him talking, and you can't do this vindictively or angrily, it's got to be very calm. And, it, and it's got to be just a question, something very innocuous. Just, you know, I, I was just curious. You know, what, I, I'm just curious about this, that kind of approach. Ask him to think of what he wanted from his own father. I promise you, you will not get an answer, or you will not get an answer that really means much of anything at that point in time. But what you are doing is you are planting a seed. And that seed will grow in his mind. It may take a week, it may take three weeks, it may take a month, it may take longer. But it will be there and it will eat at him. And he will think about it. It will come back to him and he will start chunking through that to get to the answer. And the reason being, and this question works both directions. If dad's, if grandpa, dad's dad, was a good father. We all look at, a, look at that situation and go, you know, I really want to be like my dad was growing up. It was a he was a great dad, he's a good dad, whatever. I want to be like that. And if I'm not being that way, I've somehow dropped the ball. And I want to pick that ball up and run with it. That's a good thing. If your man's dad was a lousy father for whatever reason it may be. Maybe he beat him with a belt every day or whatever the situation may be. Who knows? Or he's a heavy drinker. Who knows? Whatever the situation may be. 
that makes it made him a bad dad in your, your husband's or spouse's or significant other's mind. The question works in the exact opposite direction because then he goes, oh God, do I really want to do that to my kid? I need to not be like my dad. I need to go out of my way to make sure I'm the good, a good dad and not like what I had to grow up with. It's a win-win for you no matter what, and it's a win-win in the long run for both for your, for your, your, for your husband, significant male, other, and it's also a win for your child because in the bottom line, your child benefits. But again, don't expect an answer. The idea is to plant that seed and let him think about it and let him start figuring it out. Reinforce to him that he can express his emotions and that you will understand and not think less of him. That you're in the, you, got, you didn't marry him or, or you're not with him because necessarily of the macho, but because he, you like him as a person. You like who he is. You trust him. You, and he should trust you. Touchy-feely stuff, I know. But he needs to understand it's you know it's okay I, you know nobody's gonna hear about I'm not gonna run to my girlfriends and go oh so and so is crying or blah 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 or whatever the situation was. I will tell you when my son was born he was born eight weeks early, no reason for him to come early he just came early. Spent six weeks in a neonatal intensive care unit. Did not know if he was gonna live for a large portion of that time period. Dear God, if the phone rang after 10 o'clock at night, we were both up and dress, half dressed by the time we got the phone answered. Because you're in the NICU, you can't stay with them. At least when we, ours was little, you couldn't. There were visiting hours. You got in there on certain hours during the day, and then you had to leave. Okay? I used to, when it would get really, and I had to be the rock for my wife. You know, strong as could be, give her a shoulder to cry. Because she was hurting, and we were all both hurting. But I hit it. What I would do is wake up about 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, whenever it hit me, and I would go downstairs to our kitchen table, and I would just boo-hoo. It was in private. Nobody knew. Nobody saw. For a long, for first couple of times it happened, my wife thought I was going downstairs to get a snack. I happened to be a little bit of a stress eater, so she was assuming that I was with the stress I was going to go, and she'd roll over and go back to sleep. And then came the night that she came downstairs because she was going to say, you know, you really shouldn't be eating that much in the middle of the night. It's not good for your health. And I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and she's going, what are you doing? Nothing. I'm fine. And we had a long discussion that night because she's like, look, you're my best friend. I didn't marry you because you were macho or anything else. I'm going, thanks, dear. Just what I wanted to hear as a guy. She says, that's not what I mean. I did it because I trust you and you're, we're good partners and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all that other stuff. And you don't think you can cry in front of me? We're in this together. I know where you're coming from. I married you because I wanted things I thought you'd be a good dad. This tells me you will be. You care. But you don't need to hide this from me. I'm not going to tell anybody. And as far as she was concerned, she thought more of me for it. Okay, those are good things from a guy's perspective to hear. That she would not think less of me for having some emotion. Remind him that the relationship is a partnership. He ha doesn't have to be responsible for solving everything. It's a two-way street, and you can help. And you want to be part of that. Remember, too, that when you dis do disagree, he does care and is trying to do what he thinks is best. So don't just blow him off if you think he's way out of left field. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Give him consideration. Give his thoughts consideration. And think in mind, too. You can always try it, and if it doesn't work, you've still got the time to make a change. Or, or say, you know, you're thinking this, I'm thinking this. What about if we tried something here in the middle, if it's possible? Maybe it's a situation where you can meld the two things together and come to a middle ground. 
that, that gives him affirmation that he isn't completely off the planet when it comes to dealing with issues related to the child. And that is really important because that's also an area that we aren't comfortable in because we don't know. Encourage the participation, but don't force. I'll never forget when he was little, he was allergic to pampers. Had to use real diapers. I couldn't fold a diaper if my life depended on it. And for a while, I got chewed out about it. Diaper wasn't right, blah, 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 blah. Finally, one day, picked him up and went, here, he's yours. I'm not touching another diaper again as long as he's not potty trained. And I was mad. I wasn't going to do it. We had a friend who had been a female softball player in college. Played, played on the team. And she looked at me, and we were talking about it. And she said, well, why don't you use the baseball method of diaper folding? Baseball method of diaper folding? I've never heard of that. What is it? She put it in terms I can understand, sports. She said, simple. Take that cloth diaper. Lay it out like a shape of a baseball diamond. You know, that, that. Grab second base, bring it down to home plate. Lay the baby on the pitcher's mound, face up. Bring third base, first base, and home plate to the mound and pin without putting the pitcher on the disabled list. Makes sense. Cool. Well, first opportunity I got. I wanted to prove a point, so I went and did it. Evidently, I found afterwards she had had a conversation with my wife, and said, mm, here's what he, I taught, taught him, maybe it'll work, but I was so proud of myself. Go, here he is, the kid is diapered, and it's on, it's not falling off, everything's worked, he's not injured, no problems. And my wife said, that's really good, that, 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 that thank you, wonderful, you know. It was that affirmation that I had done something right, that I was doing it right. We look for that. We do look for affirmation from you guys that we're doing the right things, okay? Keep that in mind. So final thoughts. Breaking through the man laws is very, very hard. It's hard work. Don't quit trying. Reward the small steps forward, however works for you and your, 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 your man. Reward those small steps, but don't punish him when he screws up. Because if you punish him, that's going to be two steps back for every step forward when he's getting punished. The big thing is don't give up on your dad. Give him time, give him encouragement, and you can get there. Thank you.